Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, it really is a pleasure and a tremendous honor to be up here. Um, a few months ago, um, the invitation came to give this, this talk, and I do wish to thank the uh, Nominating Society for this. And I sat back and I thought about what we tried to do, and what we try to do as scientists and engineers. And you know, really, I think we're always pursuing this elegant solution, right? And we're trying to do things that are purposeful and that matter. And that's really what I think is probably the most important message I could possibly give, is that when we think forward and we think very purposefully, we get things done and we get the right things done. And so I wanted to spend some time looking over how we arrive at these decisions and where we go, and came up with this really, really magnanimous title. Um, but elegant solutions, I think all of us have pursued them. I think about Einstein and he spent his career doing that. But he also had a wonderful quip about how for every complicated problem, there was one elegant solution that was simple and always, always wrong, right? Because, because it's complex. And when we look at um, beautiful things like this Karina Nabila, and we look at the complexity, we, as a scientist, we want to understand, we want to know what's there. Um, but the complexity is there, and we want to understand how things are, how they work, and then we want to understand what we can control and how we can control it because we're good engineers. But the complexity is huge. And the complexity of addressing a, a crowd like you, very, very distinguished members of our society out here that I'm much in awe of, and the complexity of starting somewhere, right? And, and this talk about all of these wonderful tools we have available to us and how we might use them, and start chit-chatting a little bit in the hall with one of my dear colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Mullins, um, about where do you begin? And so I said, okay, well, you start at the beginning. And so thank you, Bill, for, for some of these wonderful graphics that you dug out and, and your um, consultations in this getting over the hump of where to start with this mess of a talk. Okay, so we can start with Pliny the Elder. Okay, that's pretty pretty good beginning, I think. And what he was able to do was to draft the first, um, the first natural history encyclopedia. And so he's interested in botany and zoology and mineralogy. But for us, he was very much interested in crystallography and looking just with the naked eye, making observations about crystal structure that we use today, the symmetries, the observations of which uh, directions grow most quickly, the patterns, the hexagonal patterns, the cubic patterns, the tetrads, and recognizing that there are symmetries and truths, and trying to understand what those truths were and describe them for us. Now, a lot happened, right? And there was a long time when we really didn't make much progress at all. But once we got past the, the, um, the wars and the plagues, we started looking again. And I think it's important to take a look at some of this early work um, in France, uh, Rene Antoine was looking just again with a handheld scope. He, he couldn't look into the interior of a, of a big, um, chunk of metal that resembled a, a rock or a stone, but he could look at its fracture surface, and from that he could deduce a lot about. It. And he gives us, uh, okay. and he gives us um, some insights into the role of grains and he talks about how they form together in arrays of molecules, and still talking about the four elements and not having a very good description of the multitude of elements and atoms and structures that we have, he deduced quite a bit. And I think the important thing um, is really, this may be the first example of government-supported work to advance manufacturing, okay? So he was director of um, a series of journals for the arts and trades, and chief among those was bringing back um, steel making and other manufacturing capabilities to France. Okay. So always, always a pursuit, and maybe not such a, a novel idea. Um, other folks that tried to understand what, what they saw beyond just the simple um, gray stones and, and metals and chunks 
that we saw around us and tried to really understand what made things interesting. We're looking at things from the scientist's point of view. And here, Whitman Stoughton was an amateur scientist, very much interested in mineralogy and very much interested in these curious things, these meteorites that, that we find every now and then. And he actually spent and can be attributed with some of the very, very first millographic techniques. So using um, flame heating and nitric acid etches and careful, careful polishing that we all know and love. He was able to decipher these wonderful basket weave patterns that now bear his name. Um, Henry Clifton Sorbe, Sorbe excuse me, was um, another very curious fellow, again a geologist, okay? And he's very famous for his geological pursuits and his contributions to the Royal Society in the UK. His work um, was trivialized in the beginning because he was scorned and folks would argue that you can't look at mountains through a microscope and what was he doing? He was so silly. But actually, um, he spent a lot of time developing and proving that we could use microscopes and we could light them very well. And we could just begin to discern and define structure below the surface of, of a metal. The image here is um, an interesting piece of, of steel from his colleague Bessemer. Okay? And they understood that there were different um, properties of the steels they could engender by introducing different elements here. Um, I think this was one of the blister steels with a higher content of, magne of manganese. And his observations allowed him to see this, this interesting pearly face, right? This, this layered structure they decided must be a combination of soft phases and thin ribbons of some sort of carbide. And it's very pearly and iridescent. And, well, we know that's pearlite now. Um, and the image um, a little bit higher is from Professor Wantanabe and his work when we actually had a photomicrograph of the sketch that he de developed. And he did work closely with his friend Henry Bessemer and guided um, a lot of the work toward more efficient steel making. And I, I want to point this out because this is when um, we really see the role of purposeful work. This was at the beginning of the Crimean War. We needed steel for cannons. We needed lots of them, or Europe did. Uh, we also needed logistics and transportation technologies. And rail was the primary mode. But the steel rails would degrade, and especially with the heavy, heavy logistics burden of preparing to fight for war and moving armament around, they were degrading within a couple of years. And so the alloy work that he did and the development of efficient techniques to develop mass quantities of steel were really driven by both the need for those cannons and the need for rails that would last, in this case, an order of magnitude longer. Um, very purposeful work, very time-driven, very urgent in small groups of people. Things that we've learned um, contribute greatly to the effect of a transition of technology.